Welcome, IV World, to prescribed title number three of the 2024 TOK series. And today's question, as IV students know, is the following. Nothing is more exciting, bold claim to start with, nothing is more exciting than fresh ideas. So why are AOKs often so slow to adopt them? Big question on the table today, and got our head of school, Dr. Krzyzkowski, senior superstar, Drew Marie, Lisa here, another IB student in TOK, and then teacher of TOK, Mr. Barton. All right, thanks panelists for joining us today. We have a huge audience, by the way, internet, massive audience. Please keep it down back there. Uh, very rude, the noise that's already starting. Uh, okay, as per normal, I'd like to start off with some rough and ready definitions, um, just so we can kind of largely agree on the terms before we start conversation. And I chose to highlight three key elements in this PT. Um, and the first one, not to be forgotten, is this kind of emotional word, exciting. Um, I think for our intents and purposes, this could either be emotionally stimulating or just intellectually, okay? So any kind of stimulating idea um, will, will count as being sufficiently exciting. But fresh ideas, this key phrase in the middle of the PT, I, wanted, I did want to pin this down for the panelists a little bit beforehand, in particular because IB students know that PT number six on this year's menu is remarkably similar to this prescribed title. In PT number six, they talk about recent evidence, which for a non-TOK student sounds a lot like fresh ideas. Um, okay, so we might want to kind of be careful not to overlap with that prescribed title too much. And one way of doing that is thinking more carefully about what fresh ideas might mean. So my suggestion to the panelists, and you guys don't have to agree with my suggestion for sure, but this is just my suggestion, that for our purposes, perhaps a fresh idea is not just some random Joe's belief or even, you know, a practicing scientist hypothesis that came to them in the laboratory one day, or an opinion. These kinds of categories that in TOK are below the level of knowledge, but nonetheless are still very important, is how knowledge kind of gets created. We begin with beliefs and opinions and hypotheses. Um, so those would be fresh ideas, but I think the answer to our question would be too easy if we stayed fixated on those. So I'm gonna be more interested in um, fresh ideas, so new knowledge claims, but they're kind of already verified here and there. Perhaps they can be more verified and confirmed. Our, after all, our ideas can always be more ver verified. Um, but they've got some support to them already. So it makes the PT even more interesting because now we're thinking like, huh, okay, so here's a new fresh idea which seems to be empirically supported. It seems like it's fairly verified already to a reasonable level, and yet communities from different AOKs don't really adopt it yet. There's some other reason why we're so slow to adopt this idea, even though it's already fairly verified. Um, so that's kind of what we might want to mean by fresh idea, I think, in today's conversation. Um, and then the last little definition I want, I did want to pin down would be the key verb of our PT at the very end, adopt. Um, what does it really mean to adopt the idea? Um, and perhaps you guys can chime in more here too, but I was roughly thinking adoption means for the community of the AOK to fully incorporate it into their theory. Um, in, in an education perspective, I think Dr. K might agree with me here, probably what that means is us teachers are willing to teach it. We're not embarrassed to teach it. We feel confident in teaching it as reasonable knowledge to pass on to future generations. Um, uh, so adoption might be a fairly strong word, but I think we can roughly mean something like that by it. Okay, so to get us going, um, I often, when I'm in the moderator chair, I like to start with a famous quote, and students who know me know I have a physics background, so aha, surprise, surprise, I start with a physicist quote. 
But this is a fairly famous one, and it's pretty interesting and kind of controversial. So German physicist Max Planck, about 100 years ago, he famously said the following. He said, a new truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die, and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. And then he goes on to say, he says, an important innovation rarely makes its way by gradually winning over and converting its opponents. So I think of this as a very kind of almost dark and Darwinian concept he has going on here. After all, he said this in the context of the new physics that he was a huge part of 100 years ago. He's like, hey, we've got this new theory, tons of evidence, actually more support for a theory than we've ever had in human history, and yet, the whole community stubbornly kind of resisted adopting it, accepting it. And so it kind of put him in a position to say something like this. It's like, oh, maybe we just need to wait for us old guys to die. And then when the new generation takes hold of the theory, then it will be really adopted. So for such a bold claim, um, how do we feel about this? I want to start with the students. Germory, what's your reaction to such a quote? I feel like I could agree with it as a new generation who oh. actually holds different opinion when I'm talking to the olds uh, versus when I'm talking to my parents. Oh. I feel like there are a lot of different opinions uh, between the old generation and the new one because, oh. because of the new technology and because of the new ideas that nowadays the society is um, establishing and spreading. But also, when I was looking at this quote, I kind of thought of math. Huh? Like, math, math being, um, the math knowledge was taught probably the same in education for generations and generations. Huh. And it would be really hard for us to resist to um, agree with it because we're taught under it. Huh. And it's probably hard for us to find another way to disprove what we have learned from math. Uh -huh. And so it, it is hard to say if I say 1 plus 1 equals 3, and I can't wait for all of the people who hold the opinion of 1 plus 1 equals 2 to die. <laughs> yeah, so. Right, right. Yeah, that would be difficult. Yeah. Nisa, what's your reaction to that? I feel like it's basically kind of claiming that um, in terms of like spreading ideas, it's not a collaborative thing to do. It's more like a fight where you influence your ideas in order for for your ideas to be accepted, kind of. Mm. And it's almost like it's not about overlapping different ideas, but having a fresh start uh. and starting something new instead of I don't know working on what what was already there. Right, right, right. So to what extent do you agree with that? Especially in terms of natural science like he's describing. Do you think you're agreeing somewhat? Um, I wouldn't really agree. Because oh. I feel like in natural sciences, it's really more about working with past works. You're building on each other's work. Mm. And every time you come up with like a new idea, it may be wrong, and another scientist will be working with your work in order to find the truth uh, or come up with the right solution, basically. Mm. Okay, all right. Yeah. And Mr. Bartman, thoughts about the quote? I, I, I love that quote. It reminds me of when I first read Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and it's a great book to read it. Um, but what that did is it took away from me the previous naive idea I had that science merely advances by evidence and everyone looks at the evidence and goes rationally, ah, great, this is nice and clear, we should all change our mind. <laughs> the, the, the actual process is a lot more complex than that. Uh, I'm not sure if I would go to the level of cynicism that I feel <laughs> that, that Planck is expressing that they literally have to die because I think <laughs> humans are capable of changing their minds. It's just there are certain emotional and psychological factors that make it difficult. Um, there is a, a, a story that Richard Dawkins, who's a famous biologist and also kind of atheist, he used to tell of trying to say how brilliant science is of a, of a scientist who'd worked 30 years 
in a field and then went to a lecture and the young new lecturer had disproved his work of 30 years and he said, well done, you have disproved my research. In a really kind of kind way, he shook his hand, took his hat off like an old English gentleman. And I thought, are scientists really going to do that or are they going to be furious? I think that, you know, it's, there's an, humans and anybody in any area of knowledge is going to be a fallible person with biases and attachments to things. And so I wouldn't completely give away the idea that we can be reasonable and change our minds with evidence, mm. uh, that we don't need to just necessarily die for things to change. Right. But I also don't think it's going to come easily or quickly. Yeah. And the next thing we might come on to later is the question of whether that's a good thing. Right, right, yeah. And then last but not least, Dr. K, especially from a leadership perspective. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I resonate. I just reflected on this quote. It, it was interesting that I, I, I have to agree because it's always, uh, and there's many examples to that, there's so much more difficult to convert, to change, regardless of what evidence you have. You can have, just as it says, you can have all the evidence, but you conversion means that you have to convince uh, your opponent in almost the opposite to their own beliefs and that's that's very difficult but when the belief is being acquired that's much more easier because when you have it's much easier to bring on board somebody with no belief at all and just introduce it as a new knowledge uh, as opposed to have somebody who already possesses some sort of a belief and say let's do that and there is many i mean if we look at the at our planet right and we'll go back to like galileo and copernic and, uh, and say, well, what they've discovered, they, they built enough evidence to, to support what they've discovered, but it took generations, plural, uh, for humanity to accept their ideas. And like now, we don't even think twice about that, because to us, now it it's almost old knowledge. Uh, but when you rewind back to their time, they had to fought and you know, we know their life story and without even going too deep in the historical backdrop, but just on evidence alone, it's it's a long journey. I mean, okay, I would maybe not go as far as the opponents die out, but yeah. but it's definitely, uh, definitely, I mean, if we look at education, like at schools, that's why it's much easier, so if I make a parallel with this, so we all know, so we all go to, the educators, I mean, so we, we all go to teachers' colleges and we learn how to be teachers and we, are, we study the history of pedagogy, methodology, and so we come out with these bright ideas of what the education world should look like. But 99% of us go into established schools and you're confronted with tradition. And like, what happened to all these ideas? And you try to, to speak up and you're not listened to. So that's why if you want the change to stick, you just start something new. You start a new school. So if we take two schools, so it's much more difficult to change an established school, to change practices, to change methodologies, to change culture and direction, then you start a brand new school that's disadvantaged in many ways. But if you try to adopt a new, fresh ideas that are proven and that have empirical evidence to support, it's much easier to do it in something new. Right. Because that's your, your parallel with generations. So you're fighting the generation that on the cerebral level understand what's better, but they hang on to the old and familiar and traditional. And it's right. difficult for them to give it up. Yeah. As opposed to new, you can just get a group of like-minded individuals and it's now you have nothing to change, but everything to create based on the ideas and evidence that you possess. Right. So, right. That's, uh, yeah. Great, great. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jerome. Sure. But, uh, that actually reminds me of the, phrase, the term power oh. somehow. I don't know, I just feel like when I saw the word die, that actually reminds me, isn't what the ancient society was like? It was like when um, scientific or scientists or people who challenge those religions or the empire itself, they actually get killed because of it. 
<laughs> Literally, it rhymes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so it just reminds me that it's probably the people who hold the power who can control what people think and um, and the um, the, the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's a great thing to highlight the power aspect because even though we're not living in those times anymore, where people yeah. aren't literally killed, it's seems to be tantamount to that. You just wait long enough for the generation to naturally die out. And so there definitely seems to be power um, in play. That's fantastic. So I think based on all of these initial reactions to that provocative quote, um, I got the sense that you guys really highlighted um, a cultural dimension, uh, if not a psychological dimension, um, to this prescribed title, which I imagine we're going to constantly be gravitating around. And then I like, in Germany's language, adding in this kind of power dimension which might be separate from the psychological one. Um, I wanted to lay out at least three other dimensions that students could use to approach this question. Um, and what I had was ethical, economic, and technological. Um, so let me just tell the panelists quickly what I mean by these, and then we can maybe think about some examples from human science specifically, because we do need to choose that A-OK -okay, um, amongst any other one. Um, so the ethical dimension I see, and TOK, we always need to address ethics, we have to. But the ethical dimension is very clear in this PT, I think, because often fresh ideas might, there might be no psychological barrier or cultural barrier. Maybe the whole community of the yoga is, is willing to accept it, they are, but there's this ethical limitation where, um, you know, as soon as we see ethical issues we probably are gonna be tempted to say, oh, the glacial speed of progress is, it might be appropriate. After all, changing our ethics, as important and serious as that is, I feel like we often come up with compelling reasons why we should be slow about updating those things. Updating our morality, we often need to update our morality, but we need to be very careful with it. So there might be strong reasons why um, things are slow if the fresh idea pertains to ethics and their ethical boundaries in a clear way. Um, so let's be aware of ethical limitations. And then changing gears entirely, I feel like there very well could be an economic dimension when answering this question too, which the most, the most bottom line economic factor for researchers at universities, for example, would be like funding. Besides publishing papers, researchers have to write grant proposals all the time. And in order to convince a non-scientist or someone outside of their AOK, -okay, in particular like a government worker, why their uh, fresh idea is so important. Well, perhaps it can't be a fresh idea, or at least they need to pretend like it's not a fresh idea. It needs to be a sufficiently popular idea for um, a non-professional to kind of really be on board and uh, be willing to send money their way. So there could be these really down-to-earth economic factors um, that get in the way of, of progress, as it were. Um, and then, last but not least, technological. I think sometimes we have fresh ideas, um, but we don't have the instruments available yet to kind of um, make them manifest or to test them properly. Um, so that could be another factor, too. Um, so in searching around in the human sciences, I did come upon um, two examples, they both happen to be more or less from psychology, so excuse my, uh, my emphasis on psychology here, but I think compared to other human sciences, you guys have already been mentioning psychology a lot, the psychological factors of this PT. I think polling from psychology as an AOK -okay is going to be really appropriate here. Um, and one that stood out to me um, that comes up in class quite often actually is um, the psychologist Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, that a lot of people, even people who have studied her work, um, you know, it comes up in popular discourse all the time, these, these classic stages. Later she made it more complicated and generalized it, but the basic picture, remember, was there's a, a denial stage um, in the case of grieving for a lost loved one, often followed by an anger stage, maybe bargaining in the middle, and then a long-lasting depression stage often, um, until finally the patient uh, might come to some final acceptance. So she had this interesting stage model of grieving. Um, and looking at the history of it, the three dimensions I just laid out, 
There could be some reasons why it took so long for people to adopt that view, which is now kind of largely taken quite seriously um, and applied in, in various areas. Um, and going through di di dimensions, again, ethically, it was at her time, it was a very taboo topic, and perhaps still today, to talk about death um, kind of straight on, scientifically, remains quite taboo. After all, we're dealing with the loved ones of, of actual human beings, and so to think about that scientifically uh, remains rather taboo, which is to say there's ethical matters to address here. Um, and then on the economic level, when she first published her work, it was super spe specific. She was only targeting terminally ill patients. So maybe the specificity of her theory didn't make it as attractive to, to funders and um, to kind of generate the interest on that level. Um, and then technologically too, the way she kind of came up with her theory were these very, what human scientists call qualitative approaches. Like she had basic surveys and questionnaires. Um, it wasn't as quantitative as we might want sometimes. Um, and again, technologically, maybe there's other equipment that we can now use or in the not so distant future use to kind of monitor people in real time um, about how they, how they uh, go through the grieving processes. So um, yeah, how do we feel about that example um, in terms of this prescribed title? Why do you think of an example like that from human science? Why, why was that arguably so uh, um, slowly adopted? Because it was a fresh idea when she first proposed it. Any thoughts there? I'm wondering if you, you, you hinted at the, the taboo aspect, but I'm wondering if there's also an aspect there whereby the vagueness of these stages. I mean, oh. we, can, we can understand what denial is when you've experienced it, but it's not an easy thing to define. And so to be able to say, well, here's stage one, here's stage two, here is a, a typical trajectory. And presumably her theory isn't that everybody goes through these procedures uh, processes in exactly the same way all the time. Right. right. So what we're seeing are general patterns that she is noticing if she, if she did qualitative research in terms of how people's feelings are. Can you imagine sifting that out, finding which ones count as denial? Now, okay, I felt like that was denial, okay. Mm -hmm. the, the, all of these things are, are not fitting neatly into boxes in the same way that when you have quality, uh, quantitative research, you can make a very precise prediction and say, well, I'm looking for this number to come out at the end of my data. And when it comes, that feels like a very powerful confirmation. Whereas in human sciences, normally you're looking for something, something statistically significant in a pattern, and what that pattern is, you are also creating fresh. So deciding what counts as statistically significant would be quite vague. I, I was just gonna piggyback on the, on the uh, sort of research aspect of this as as a. Uh, Mr. Barton pointed out, is uh, I think the so what where we are now with the five stages we we almost not almost but we we with confidence say that those exist and we have uh, and while we can uh, speculate that they each stage could be different for everybody but we don't deny the fact those stages exist and that's the sequence that they run through and while so but then. The, the root cause of all of this is with human sciences, we heavily rely on the on the quantitative research. And traditionally the people Qual qualitative. Qualitative, qualitative yeah, yes. Yeah. Because sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's all oh, exactly that was my point. So right. and qualitative research eventually becomes quantitative, but you have to have uh, mountains of evidence more to build up to turn qualitative into quantitative because you look for patterns, you understand human behavior, which is different from one subject to the next. While it doesn't easily fit into numbers, which the world tends to be when, it, when the evidence, as far as the evidence go, the world tends to be convinced much faster and easier with numbers, with the quantitative outcome. And therefore, in a, in a scientific world, often, the, the people from sort of a, the science, not, not the human sciences, but 
um, natural sciences yeah. and whatnot, they would say like, well, we, we do real research, and you guys in human sciences, this is all speculation, uh -huh. which to a point, it's, it's right, but I think it's much more difficult to run uh, a human sciences qualitative research, but also I think the evidence in a roundabout way is much stronger than just numeric expression. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we talk about fresh ideas, mm -hmm. so fresh idea, as soon as it could get quantified and put in numbers, mm -hmm. then it's not so fresh anymore because it's pretty clear cut. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some examples of that not working quite mm -hmm. as simple as I just said. Mm -hmm. But with the uh, qualitative evidence, you, you work with human behavior yeah. and, and it takes, and it's much more finite how you define what and yeah. so, and that's when everything, like even, so ethics enters that because talking, given the example of, of life and death, that's a, a, a very sensitive subject and you, if you introduce cultural aspect, so in one culture, it's pretty okay to talk about it, like mm -hmm. if you talk about the Nordic culture where it's, uh, that the sort of a, the sort of a, the life and death are very clearly defined and it's okay. Uh -huh. And then if you move further east mm -hmm. to to like Buddhist culture, it's or Hindu culture for that matter, it's a very different concept to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so then that's like you have to redefine that. Mm -hmm. And so again, to accumulate everything in one research evidence box, yeah. it takes quite a lot of work. And, uh, and that's why I think, so the fresh idea so remain, remains fresh for much longer, mm -hmm. and hence gets adopted much slower. Mm -hmm. So That's interesting, yeah. Jeremy, you look like you had a thought too here. Oh, uh, it was kind of the same thing. I yeah. was gonna say that um, it's probably hard because you can't just come up to a patient and ask for his or her feelings about um, about death. Right. Is it fair to say you're noticing another ethical limitation? Yeah. Is there something ethically difficult about that? Because, because research requires a lot of data mm. and um, uh, statistics, but to, to back up, but in terms of um, researching ill patients' thoughts, mm. um, it's probably hard to ask them to talk about it. Right. as it's a taboo and also um, humans are are weak emotionally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very true statement, yeah. 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 <laughs> true statement we say today, internet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Nisi, do you have any thoughts about this stages um, of grief example? I would say that Contrasting it to natural sciences, mm. I would say that unlike natural sciences where it's easier to have like a controlled experiment, mm. it's really hard to have a controlled experiment in human sciences because you're dealing with so many factors and it's really hard to find a pattern among these factors because human beings are really different from each other. Oh. It's not because someone likes something that another person will like it or it's not because you think a certain way that everyone thinks the same way. Yeah. And so a certain idea can be really controversial for someone, but okay for someone else. Right, right. I love that thesis layered in that too, because before we had this distinction between qualitative research and quantitative research, which is between human sciences and natural sciences. But I think thesis point is importantly different. Like, it's true, natural sciences can control their experiments more easily than human sciences, mm -hmm. but it does, does, doesn't necessarily line up with this quantitative qualitative difference. It's a whole other difference. Um, that's that's a really great observation. It's like imagine, yeah, physicists physicists saying, oh yeah, Brazilian electrons are different than Nigerian electrons. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sounds like you're doing human science. Yeah, um, great. I did have one other example from the human sciences, since half of our essay, where we to choose to write on this one, would have to deal with the human sciences. Um, so we could discuss that. I'm gonna leave it to the panelists. So we could talk more human sciences, or do we want to get into other AOKs? Some people are already mentioning natural sciences. Um, I think I think it'd be worth mentioning why. 
I mean, my, my theory about why they have chosen the human sciences as the A-OK -okay yeah. that you have to choose for right. this yeah. relates to the replication crisis. I feel like this mm. whole pre PT is not explicitly yeah. telling me to talk about that, but that would make sense to me, that we have, yeah. in the human sciences, there's a bigger issue than in other areas about confirming yeah. evidence. Yeah. And so the question of where, why are they so slow suggests Maybe we have to be a little careful about yeah. what counts as a yeah. good idea because some people will put forward ideas that then no one can actually replicate. And right. they get published in journals. Right. So um, like, but they, when they do, they've gone through some peer review, but then not sufficiently right. rigorous. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> um, no, 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 please. I can ask that one. Okay, okay, okay. okay. No, I, I, I uh, completely agree. I think the human sciences is, is a much vaster area, if there is such a word. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it permeates our being and always will, regardless of where we are in our development and our scientific discovery. While the scientific discovery, such as natural sciences, mathematics, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's the fresh idea arises it takes sometimes, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, but then it gets adopted eventually, it becomes old knowledge and we built on it. And we, so you can sort of, in a concrete sequential way, you can trace the trajectory of development of, of those. While in human sciences, it's really difficult to do that because it takes, for well, all the reasons we just mentioned, so without repeating it, yeah. because, and while we see the evidence it seems like we, as as a human race, yeah. we were a lot less uh, reluctant yeah. to accept uh, ideas that are scientific yeah. as opposed to the ones yeah. that come from yeah. the world of human science. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. I just wanted to highlight Dr. K's observation just now. The whole first example of stages of grief from Kubler Ross is kind of a microcosm of precisely what Dr. K just told us because. Her initial criticism was that her stages were too linear. But eventually she explained to fellow researchers in the world, like, look, no, this could be very complicated and nonlinear. And Dr. K seems to be telling us now, like, oh, that could be the whole nature of human sciences as AOKs to begin with. Like, they don't necessarily have this linear progression that you know physics is famous for, or maybe even mathematics is famous for. It actually kind of grows. Perhaps we do kind of loop back and go. Um, back to previous ideas and theories of human sciences. Um, so that's that's really cool on, on multiple levels. Um, as another, since we should stay longer, like Mr. Barton rightfully was saying, by the way, that was a nice throwback to a previous year's PT of replication crisis. So TOK fans out there, yeah, that was a, a throwback PT. But yeah, psychology is famously or notoriously accused of this replication crisis. New results published in psychology, and yet the researchers kind of fail to replicate their findings. Um, and one example of such a thing um, would be the bystander effect. Um, so another example from psychology um, is the following. The bystander effect says basically that individuals, humans, are less likely to help a victim when other people are present. This is the bystander effect. And it was proposed by two psychologists in the 60s. And this, along the lines of this PT, took a long time to be taken seriously and adopted and accepted. And across these dimensions I've outlined, so ethically, first and foremost, we hear something like that from these psychologists, and like, oh my God, it goes against my intrinsic goodness. Everyone, every personal, per, you know, person is personally thinking when they first read this, like, oh, I'm a, I'm a good Samaritan, if someone's in, in trouble and I'm in a crowd just because I'm a crowd, I would still help someone in trouble. So it kind of violates this, this inner morality that most of us feel to begin with. Um, economically, I'm sure we could think of all sorts of examples and reasons for why such research might not be supported further. And this bystander effect seems to have um, you know, political repercussions. And then 
technologically too. I mean, it's tough. Again, back to what we were saying with our previous examples. When we're just dealing with surveys and questionnaires, it's it's tough to unless we're real time monitoring such a thing. But if we were to do that, then it goes back to ethical problems that Germer pointed out. Like, is it right for us to, to be gathering data while there's an actual victim on the ground needing help um, and seeing what bystanders do? Um, so yeah, so how do we feel about this one more example from the human sciences that undeniably took time to be adopted? It was a fresh idea. Um, and furthermore, we tend, there seems to be a decent amount of evidence and acceptance now. Um, so how do we feel about this one? I have two points. Uh, ethical. Mm. So one is that um, if we, if we send, send the experiment psychologists did do the experiment, yeah. for example, on the street, uh -huh. to just make a play and see if people will help or not, at the end, if you if you let those people know that it's a it's a it's a play, then um, they might not go help that person again. Right. Because they might think in their mind that oh, what if I was tr I was tricked again or something like that. Uh. And another thing is that because uh, researchers they have the reputation and mm. um, authority in this field, so they have to take responsibility of. Uh, the public views mm. because they can guide them. Right. And what if the bystander effect is published and people justify their um, their behavior of not helping others as a way of, oh yeah, it's naturally like this. Or we're born like this, so it's okay if I don't help. So what if the people think that way? thoughts here? Or reactions to Germany's great thoughts? I was just thinking about how long, the, just the literal amount of time it is. One, one thing that's not de defined in the PT is slow. Oh. So I, I would ask a human scientist, if it takes a year for your work to become adopted, is that slow or oh. fast? I think for most of them, it's that's really fast. Right. There, so there are people who do develop, developmental psychology and they run 20 year experiments. They're looking at the impact on a child. You do this thing when they're a baby, what's the outcome? Let's wait and see how they grow up. For someone to then replicate that, we're talking about another 20 years to follow, mm -hmm. and see, let's see if I get the same data. So what, what counts as slow? I think in the human sciences, a lot of these things, to set the right environment up, to go check you're doing things in the right way, it could take um, a long time. And I would compare it to um, a scientific experiment where I can imagine you're firing radio waves at a target or something like that to see how they bounce off. A computer could measure 100 of those in a second or something. You know? And then you get a huge amount of data in such a short amount of time. Oh. Whereas the human scientist is dealing with all these other variables. Like I, was, I wanted to try and measure this bystander, but then someone, the weather changed and it's a different environment now. Right, you know? right, yeah. So it's almost as if we should like relativize the ET, like relative to the pace of the experiment or the, the mm -hmm. nature of what's being studied. Yeah. I, I think with this example, I was just uh, start thinking uh, sort of around the box. So there's this uh, a psychologist, Chris Argus, a Harvard psychologist who studies uh, study organizational behavior, and he actually he maintained he said that similar so that when we talk when we try to like, inspire an organization and try them to go a certain direction so the bystander effect oh. comes into effect saying well i'm in a group so somebody else will do this right. and i will so basically not everybody is a natural leader right. most people in fact are natural followers it might even and, happen in student group projects yeah. i don't know so, yeah. <laughs> no i think it happens it happens I mean, that's a digression, but it happens <laughs> in any group, no matter. Yeah. We can be as scientific as we want to putting a group of students together. It's yeah. always, the dynamics always takes place. It is the same. That's like his, most of his work. But I think this effect also, uh, so with the ethical standpoint, saying like, well, I'm, I'm contributing to the greater good. 
and so so the Good Samaritan uh, effect only so kind of goes back to Darwin. It's just that people by nature were with, with competitors. So we're not necessarily wired to help each other, we're, we're wired to get ahead. But if there is no one around, and if it's just me and the victim, so this is when the Good Samaritan effect kicks in. And, and then you start, uh, if you, that's where your intrin intrinsic goodness comes through, because there is, because there's no one else around. Uh -huh. and, uh, and again, so that also, by any stretch, not a new notion. Yeah. And so translating to organizations, so as Chris Argus said many times, he said that, well, we all know that, that that's the fact, but yet we try in organizational way, in organizational development to address that, that yeah, everybody chips in and we're all good to go, but that never happens. Mm -hmm. And there is example after example after example that it doesn't happen, although there's every evidence that if we actually all chipped in right. at this um, Western Electrical study that was yeah. done back in the 1930s, saying, yeah. okay, once the people all figure out that I am a smaller piece of a greater good, and if I work hard, we all benefit. Right. So that's just, and of course that's attached to uh, the material compensation, whatnot, but yeah. if, you, if you try to apply that to a higher level uh, individuals and try to say, okay, let's try to go that, uh, right. to move the organization in the right way. Right. Everybody wants it to move, but nobody really does that. Uh -huh. So kind of, that's the same bystander effect. And again, yeah. that's not something new. Uh -huh. That's that's the idea that that's, we, we can, you know, every hundred years, if we can come up with it and say, oh, it's a fresh idea. But it's the same one that existed hundred years ago, and we didn't really act upon. So now we reinvented the same thing, right? And just so I think that's maybe a human psyche that kind of oh. goes in cycles. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think this is probably a more interesting example to yeah. to, to discuss because even as we as we sit here today, we know that that's how true that is, and yeah. we know what works, what doesn't work. But we we just can't get out of our own way huh. to, to make it all happen. Right, right, right. That's really fascinating. It's kind of, it's almost like the hidden game theory behind yeah. this PT. Yeah. yeah. But, um, right, so we're, we're getting closer to our allotted time and, and we do want to touch upon some other AOKs in, in case there are some students out there that um, prefer other AOKs and they're definitely writing on this PT. Um, let's. If it's okay with the panelists, let's put natural sciences aside too. So after all, they are sciences also, and, and Lisa and others have, have brought them up already. Um, but we do have math and history and the arts, most interestingly. Um, so um, feel free to talk about any of those three. Um, some examples that came off the top of my head were history of mathematics, like uh, imaginary numbers, complex numbers, like those were very ridiculed, and so many mathematicians were allergic to these creatures, these abstract creatures at first, but hey, lo and behold, eventually they're accepted, and so it's very interesting, and I think it's important for the TOK student to realize that usually math and natural science go hand in hand, but I suspect with this PT, they come apart quite strongly. There's kind of very different reasons why a fresh idea in math might not be accepted um, as quickly as one in science. So we could definitely think about math. And then the arts is definitely very easy in this respect too. Think about just abstract art movements themselves, how hard it was for abstract artists to kind of make a name for themselves and, and develop these movements. Um, and then also new uh, media too, all new types of media thanks to technology. Even, even video games. It's like up until this day, many people still don't treat games as art. Although, if you look at younger generations, they're very much art. Um, so what's going on there? Um, and then history not to be forgotten. There's a whole school of thought in history, of course, called revisionism, which is all about, the whole methodology of revisionist history is precisely to go back and to kind of give, maybe not a fresh idea per se, but a fresh perspective on some key events. Um, 
Uh, and there's one in particular that comes up called the Thucydides Trap, um, which has a lot to do, it was first brought up in terms of American and Chinese relations, um, but it has a lot to do with this idea of established powers versus rising powers um, and predicting the relationships between such powers, um, which was a fresh idea at the time and still is kind of um, resisted from being fully accepted. So what do you, what do we think about other AOKs in regards to SBT? I'll leave it open. Math, history, art, what's, what's attracting our attention? I will jump in now. Yeah, um, thanks, Mr. Martin. So, with the fresh ideas, I, I'm quite tempted to talk about art as, a, as yeah. an option. I mean, they're all yeah. they're all appealing in different ways, but because art seems to be so much about having fresh ideas, right. there's a natural tendency to, to see this as an appropriate one to pick. Um, I like that idea about video games, and, and I wondered whether the resistance is um, because there isn't you don't have this um, infrastructure, academic infrastructure that has to gradually build up. So people have to, you know, universities have to decide to appoint somebody who's going to teach the art of video games, and these yeah. things take a little while so that there becomes a community in, in this area of knowledge that accepts these things, right. and then you get them talked about in the right circles, and then children start to learn in schools. The next generation learns about this as an art. Right. So there's a, that process to set up the infrastructure might take longer. Uh, I think there's something about art which is moving really fast, but I always talk about this kind of triangulation when we think about art as an area of knowledge and not just talking about the producers of new art, fresh ideas, uh, but also the audiences have to move with that. Uh, and then the people who are critics or reviewing or in academic spaces talking about it have to try and keep up with both the new art and the audience's responses to it. Right. So with art, you have this triangulation of fresh ideas. Yeah where you want to be talking about adoption, presumably with the art, you can talk about the audience adopting them and not just artists adopting them. Yeah, yeah. And that, I, I have to, that's a great thought from Mr. Barton, because it reminds me of a previous PT this very year where we were discussing that kind of dialectic, that trade-off. And it's a lovely thought because I think one consequence part of what Mr. Barton is saying is it, we want super freshness in the arts. Like it does seem to be the essence of, of what's going on in the arts. But if the audience isn't fully on board, or if it's too fresh, sometimes people are too radical or too extreme with their new genres of art. If the audience um, is not on board, then it, it, it falls through. Um, it's not going to uh, kind of contribute to, to the arts. Um, yeah, just drawing with the scientific art examples, trying to tie it back to, to the quote yeah. of the generations. Yeah. I think we are, like right now, we are living in that moment where we have the old and the new. Oh. So, so we have, we have the, the, there is a generation of, of, of people yeah. who are, are, who basically, let's call it the traditional art appreciators. Uh -huh. And so there is a new generation of our younger generation that don't necessarily deny yeah. that experience, but built on it. And so for them, so the video game is an art form and they see it as such. Yeah. So because they're, they're not converted and they're going with this. So it's really difficult for the other group to convert and to see, because first of all, that's something very new to them yeah. and fresh, and they have hard time adopting it. Yeah. While on the cerebral level, they understand that yes, that's that's an art form, and yes, we know why, and we have all the evidence pointing pointing to it. But it's uh, it's not easy to just adopt that because it's. it's but, but again, the evidence to why it is an art form. I mean, we. I mean, there is a gamification of everything now uh -huh. as, a, as a methodology and a tool that works. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we, we talk that the anime is almost, I think, is accepted as an art form. But anime came from video game mm -hmm. because that's where the characters were developed and first appeared. And then they were evolved. And again, even now, still, 
as accepted as anime is by sort of a vast majority, there is still some of that generation that needs to kind of cycle out. And the more we have newer generation that adopts this fresh idea, the less fresh it becomes. But I would say it's still, it's probably, so using the anime example, that's probably less fresh out of all the ideas as far as, but still pretty fresh. And it's, but again, on the scope, uh, the timeline is really historically very short for that, so we maybe need to wait another hundred years. <laughs> and then it becomes, then we'll turn the page completely. Right. So, right. Um, to, to oh. add on that, oh. I think it's just simply that it's hard for uh, musicians and artists themselves who, who have new styles to, to continue to um, to continue to create something like that if, if um, their financial base is on popularity mm. of the public and they simply couldn't make a living because of it, that they have to give up on their new style and to um, to adapt to what the, pub the public likes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not that it, it adopts slowly, it's that it, it disappears too fast. Oh, inter mm -hmm. interesting distortion of that. I mm -hmm. love that. So That's it cool. doesn't really have time to develop. Yeah. Because it disappears. Because, mm -hmm. wow, that is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really great. It reminds me of people who study innovation, like what it mm -hmm. takes to innovate in the, in the business world. It's very, they end up, after lots of research, you know, mm -hmm. confirming your theory that, like, it's one thing to invent something, a fresh idea, but then it's a whole different ballgame to make it stick. Completely. to make it last. Um, that's a really cool um, kind of reinterpretation of the whole PT, yeah. Nisa, did you have any thoughts about the arts or, or even math or history? Which, sorry, math and history people. <laughs> yeah. I was going to talk about visual arts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, about abstract art. Or yeah. The idea that art coexists with power of presenting the visible world. Oh. was basically challenging the traditional artistic convention because um, I feel like it was basically it would it took time for people to get used to it because um, the artists actually have to learn how to follow I would say like the different techniques basically oh. like how to duplicate again like the same style oh. and yes the audience likes it and wants new ideas but it's hard for the artist as well oh. to get used to it oh. and be able to create art based on this one technique. Mm. Mm. Fascinating, right. Okay. Cool. And that's with with abstract art you're thinking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, we're coming to uh, the end of our a lot of time. Panelists, any kind of Final thoughts, or anyone feel inclined to talk about math or history? <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say, because I'm, I'm kind of the token math guy too, so for the sake of mathematics, I might interject here. Uh, infinitesimals, which is a technical term I know, Mr. O'Brien's sitting on this, I know he knows what that means, but infinitesimals are infinitely small quantities. Mm. So not infinitely large, which are all the infinities, which yeah, for religious reasons, people were very allergic to them in math for a while, but now they're everywhere. Math is full of infinity. It's almost old hat. We don't care about infinity anymore. But infinitesimals, in these small things, which I care deeply about, they, when calculus was first started, we were so afraid of these things, even though the whole theory depends on them. So much so that we came up with painstaking definitions that systematically avoided their real existence. All these limits and like we can shrink things more and more as much as we want, but we never actually say, oh yeah, there are infinitely small things. To this day, what I find fascinating in this math example, anyone who wants to talk about math to steal this example, definitely. It's to this day, people, mathematicians, professional mathematicians, are still afraid of these things. And they're infinitely small too. Why would you be afraid of an infinitely small thing? Yeah, it seems so kind of um, harmless. Um, but So that's fascinating, because they are proven to be very useful. If you say they exist in math, and you know how to do things with them. For example, a uh, basic fact of infinitely small things, 
If you multiply an infinitely small thing by itself, you get zero. It's, it's the founding rule of infinitely small things, which makes sense. So we have these basic intuitive rules, and yet even professionals are afraid of these things. So I feel like that's the reasons there are going to be very different than everything we've entertained today, um, which makes it all the more fascinating. Um, okay, so I don't want to end on a mathy note, but may, maybe we are. I apologize for that. Uh, can we thank the panelists? Yeah. All right. Um, ever so large audience, we only have time for a few, so people in the back, uh, we won't be able to get to you. But questions out there? Anyone? Okay, I had one. Oh, thank um, you, Miss Franks. Because <laughs> yeah. we started talking about it in class today, but I don't think we like delved deep onto it. So, like, could a new, like, could a fresh idea be like disproving another idea? Ooh. Who wants to reply to that? Like, would that be adopted in, like, if, because it's being disproved? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What, what I was explaining to you in the class was that it could be because to disprove an idea that the public holds is a lady of that idea. That's what I said, but um, I feel like Mr. Fire really. <laughs> 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 Tell us more, Mr. <laughs> Fire. I would say it could it be <laughs> as an example of a fresh idea. I think that you'd have to do some very careful work in your paragraph to explain what you're counting as a fresh okay. idea. <laughs> and why you think it's fresh. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, when you're defining at the beginning and talking mm -hmm. about that, you don't want to end up with an idea that causes you to add a whole paragraph explaining why you've chosen this example, if you can mm -hmm. find other examples that might mm -hmm. just uh, giving you more bu uh, bang for your buck or more more power in fewer words. But could I could could I just ask Abby, could you clarify a little bit what you're asking? So like yeah. I wrote it to me. Yeah. <laughs> So, if something just proves that a fresh idea, and do you think like that's adopted? Like, if the fresh idea mm. is like proven wrong, uh, is that adopted within the AOK? Okay? Oh, like, interesting. If, if the idea itself yeah. became fresh, and right. then it was proven to be a wrong idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. But just trying to. Sorry, I'm trying to. No, no, no. So, I'm going to do the habit yeah. of, of speaking back to the no, person please, trying to see please. if I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. What you're saying, it seems to me, is there is a fresh idea. Right? Yeah. It's, it's sufficiently seriously entertained, but then it's proven wrong, right. quite wholesale. Right. But that negative evidence. Is almost fresh. Exactly, in that's what I'm trying to get. So like at. the backside that's of the fresh idea, at. which is to say the opposite of the fresh right. idea, all is also fresh. But yeah, I was just gonna say yeah. that that new idea that disproves or proves the the previous one that becomes fresh. Exactly. Idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's sort of a, a yeah. Well, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But like, is it is then like fully adopted if yeah. it proves something else wrong? I don't know. I don't want to rule it out, but I think you're going to get some pretty complicated writing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do it on my thing. I just thought it was an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great thought that I got. Yeah. I do have another question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, so, like, the idea of the public holds a <laughs> I think if you were to explain why on some occasions AFKs and areas of knowledge have been very quick to adopt certain ideas, that could also go to help your explanation of why normally they are not. Um, so under these circumstances, we saw this huge change in the social sciences, for example, in our understanding about uh, how we should treat certain conditions or um, I think you mentioned the idea of how much change happened in a short space of time in the conditions of the COVID period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if those are special circumstances and then they're removed, why would that be that we then go back to a slower procedure, mm -hmm. for example, verifying a vaccine? Mm -hmm. I think 
using the cab to example could be a really powerful way to then exemplify why normally we have slower procedures yeah. in place, like the Food and Drug Administration in for testing foods. Yeah. Um, if we were suddenly really, really hungry, uh, and this is the only food, they might say, well, you know what, I'm not going to test this berry, I need to eat. Yeah. For COVID vaccine testing. Yeah. Exactly, that was what we were trying to do. Yeah, with yeah. this, I think, I would go back to the definition of fresh idea and see what becomes fresh idea, because some of that's the examples you just used, so they're necessity-driven. So are they fresh? Yeah. Are they fresh? Uh, is it congruent with our definition of fresh idea? I think with the COVID vaccine, there was a really new technology yeah. involved. It delivered the, the yeah, vaccine in a novel way. But I, I guess under you remove the pandemic situation, mm -hmm. and that wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be wouldn't be considered fresh. It would be another ten years before it would become a fresh idea in our definition, working mm -hmm. definition that we're using. Mm -hmm. But under the circumstances of COVID, mm -hmm. yeah, it's fresh and it's adopted. Boom, because there's no other, there's no alternative. Yeah, but there's no time to run experiments and right. collect evidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you do the bare minimum. Yeah. And uh, yeah. even if we if we trace, this, just going on with the same example of vaccines, because there's a number of vaccines. And so some of them, <laughs> some, of this, some of them are more fresh than others because there's a whole yes. uh, myriad of how they got adopted, which one gets ahead. And again, it's like who can, uh, which side, scientific group or group of scientists could prove with minimum of evidence effectiveness of this vaccine. Yeah. But none of them actually had enough evidence that would be required mm. under normal circumstances, not yeah. on pandemic. Because you remove pandemic, none of them would be approved till this day. Mm. I mean right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So so I guess so, so we're just splitting hairs with what fresh idea is and how we define it and right. the whole. So if, if uh, from the practicality of a writer, mm -hmm. I would maybe just avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> so, or, or define your terms up front too, okay, it's too yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions from the large audience? <laughs> no? All right. Thanks again, everyone, Thanks. for coming. Thank All right.